Arthur, welcome. Thank you. Great to be with you. So great to have you. It's such an honor. I'm a big fan of your work and I loved your book from strength to strength. And you start the book by this really interesting story to say the least about a man on a plane who changed your life. So yeah. can you tell us what exactly happened? Yeah. I mean, I used to travel a lot for, for work. I was a, I was the chief executive of a think tank in Washington, DC. I still travel a lot. And and so I was always on these airplanes and beavering away on my laptop, doing things that I thought were incredibly important and urgent all the time. And it was one night that I was coming back from Los Angeles to, to Washington, DC, where I lived. And I heard a conversation. I overheard a conversation. I should say of an elderly couple behind me on the plane. It was dark, so I couldn't see them, but I could hear the man telling his wife that he might as well be dead. I could tell by their voices. They were probably in their eighties. And she was consoling him and he said, it's not, she says, nobody cares about me. Nobody pays attention to me anymore. No way I even take my calls. And she was consoling him for 20 or 25 minutes. And I was thinking, this is a guy who's obviously disappointed that his life didn't turn out very well. You know, I'm a behavioral social scientist. So, you know, I, my, my laboratory is the airplane is overheard conversations. Kind of, this is where I get my ideas for what I'm going to write about and do my research. And when we landed in Washington, DC, we all stood up and I turned around cause I was kind of curious and it turned out to be one of the most famous men in the world. Somebody that we all know who's done incredible things with his life. He's not controversial. He's beloved. He's rich. He's famous. And I thought to myself, and this was sort of lurking anyway, you know, I was 50 years old or so at the time. And, you know, it was kind of at the top of my career, but I was thinking, wonder how long I can keep this party going. And this guy had 10 times the party I ever had, and it had stopped and he was pretty unhappy, you know, the, and it, it occurred to me. And this is something I knew, of course, but it really, it, it pointed something out really poignantly to me that we have a, the wrong model. You know, we think that if we work and achieve and succeed, then we can get that success and get satisfaction and bank it and die happy. And that's just wrong. It's just completely wrong. And so I went in search of an answer to why that guy, maybe he's an outlier. But why that actually probably would have happened, what I found was that, in fact, there's a striver's curse, that people who did a lot earlier in their lives, who achieved a lot, had a lot of success, they're the ones who are most likely to be unhappy in the latter part of their lives because of this misbegotten model of banking success and being satisfied going forward. And I thought, you know, I've heard about a lot of famous rich people who, who, who spend their fortunes and, and are poor later in life. And what they need is a 401k. <laughs> and what we need for this guy is a happiness 401k. What I need is a happiness 401k. What we all need is the happiness plan so that we don't have to leave it up to chance. And so I worked on it for six years and that's this book. This is a happiness 401k plan for strivers and, and everybody else. So what do you think this says about our quest for fame and wealth and our society's obsession with it? Well. There's a natural tendency to look after what St. Thomas Aquinas, based on Aristotle, would call the idols that occupy us. These are the things that turn us away from the true sources of our happiness. And they, they promise, they overpromise and underdeliver. And they're money, power, pleasure, and fame. And by fame, I don't mean worldwide fame. I mean, most people listening to us right now are, you know, they don't want to go out. They don't want to be, a, you know, Paris Hilton, or she's not even famous anymore. But you get, you know, Lady Gaga. They, they want... They don't want that, but they want to be admired for what they do well. They want people to say, oh, there goes so-and-so who did a really good job at such and such. Everybody wants, that's normal. But those are idols, according to Aquinas, because they distract us from the true sources of our bliss. Now, there's a reason for that. The brain wants us to do that. That's an evolutionary imperative to accumulate money, power, to get a lot of pleasure, and to be admired by other people, because that's how you pass on your genes. Mother nature wants you to want those things. And so we do, and mother nature crosses our circuits in a funny way, is a conspiracy of our brains against ourselves to think if I get those things, since I want those things, then getting those things should make me happy. But newsflash, mother nature doesn't care if you're happy. Mother nature just wants you to pass on your genes. If you're going to be happy, that's up to you. And you must fight many of your tendencies. The old idea that if it feels good, do it is just dead on wrong. We actually have to be informed consumers of human life. We have to build our lives. We have to be well under our own jurisdiction, morally, physically, emotionally, psychologically. And if we don't do that, we're just going to chase on the hamster wheel for the rest of our lives and, and feel pretty bummed out by the end, like the man on the plane. 
Well, I think you're hitting on this idea you spent some time talking about in the book and it's satisfaction, you know, feeling good. We want to be satisfied. Yeah. What, what, how should we be thinking about satisfaction? So the most, the third most famous rock and roll song of all time, according to Rolling Stone magazine is I can't get no satisfaction by, by the Rolling Stones. And when Mick Jagger sings that, you know, it's not like it's a great song, but it speaks this eternal truth that you try and you try. And, and he talks about sort of sex and consumerism is what you try to do, which is money, power, pleasure, fame is those idols again and again. Now, the truth of the matter is a little bit more complicated than that. It's not true that you can't get no satisfaction. The truth is that you can't keep no satisfaction. So, so first let's define satisfaction. Satisfaction is the joy you get for meeting a goal. It's the reward for a job well done. Now it's not the only part of happiness. Satisfaction and happiness are not the same thing. Happiness, which many people regard as a feeling, which it also isn't. That's like saying that their Thanksgiving dinner is the smell of the turkey. That's not what happiness is either. Your Thanksgiving dinner is made up of three things, protein, carbohydrates, and fat. And your happiness is made up of three things as well. Enjoyment, satisfaction, and purpose, which you need in abundance and you need in balance. So, and satisfaction is basically just one macronutrient of happiness, but it's a very hard macronutrient to keep. Your body tells you, your brain tells you to, to chase it and chase it, to try to keep it and lies to you saying that if you get that thing, then you'll have satisfaction forever. But we have to have more knowledge than that to understand that in fact, there is joy from a job well done, but it doesn't last. Now there's a, there's a physical process for this called homeostasis. It's, it, it can, it conspires against our permanent satisfaction. Any human biological process uh, takes us always back to our equilibrium. So if you're on the treadmill and you're working out and you get good cardiovascular health and you, and your pulse goes up to 160 beats per minute, 15 minutes after you get off the treadmill, your pulse goes back to where it was, or you die sooner or later. The same thing is true with your emotions. When you actually hit a goal, you get some joy. When you're afraid or sad, you feel bad. Those are basic, basic positive and negative emotions that happen to you through the limbic system of your brain but you go back to normal so you can be ready for the next set of circumstances. Your basic emotions are evolved to keep you alive. Yet you need to go back to your equilibrium, but your brain always lies to you and says that they're permanent. So when somebody has a bad breakup, they think I'm gonna feel horrible forever, but of course they don't. When they're afraid of something that's just episodic, they think, oh, it's gonna be horrible forever run and then a day later, it's like, oh, I feel better. And when you're really happy about your goal met, your satisfaction, the joy that you get, you think you're gonna keep it forever and then it lasts a day or a week or 10 days and then you're back running again. So how do you think about that tension between goal setting? Because there's nothing wrong with setting a goal and working hard and accomplishing that goal. And I think most people would agree, whether you're talking about athletics or entrepreneurship or whatever it may be in life or your personal relationships, you set a goal, you work hard out of your accomplishment and there's nothing wrong with that. But invariably there's this tension where you talk about in the book where we're almost addicted to success. And so how do you think about the tension of, Hey, I like goal setting. I like working hard, accomplishing goals, but at the same time, I, I can't become addicted to it. I can't yeah. let the goals rule. How do you think about that? So you mentioned success addiction, which is a real addiction. And by that, I don't mean it's a metaphor. All of our addictions in life, whether it's to drugs and alcohol, pornography, gambling, whatever it happens to be things that we wish people wish they didn't do compulsively. And yet they do. It's because they have dopamine that's implicated in this. Now, dopamine is a neuromodulator. It's produced endogenously by the brain. It doesn't bring pleasure. I mean, people always talk about it as a pleasure chemical. It's not. It's actually an anticipation of pleasure thing. It, it, it gives you this desire to hit the, hit the goal, to hit the lever, to get the cookie, to get whatever it is. And your brain gets better and better at producing dopamine in response to a certain set of behaviors, which then we start to engage in compulsively. So you find that video gamers, for example, they produce enormous amounts of dopamine when they think about video gaming. Smokers, cigarette smokers, they think they, when they're ready to smoke, the, the nicotine addiction leads them to have dopamine production when they think about a cigarette, when the phone rings or when they wake up in the morning or when they have a cup of coffee, whatever it happens to be. And for success addicts, these are people who have objectified themselves as successful people over many years. Perhaps their parents did it to them, perhaps they did it to themselves, but they know that they're going to get this little satisfaction from whatever success, admiration, or reward they get is the raise, it's the promotion, it's the compliment, it's the envy of other people. That's the lever that they hit and the dopamine makes them hit the lever. And, and they always think if I get that next promotion, if I get that better job, if I'm the top of my field, 
then I'll feel the satisfaction and it'll last forever. But dopamine lies, your dreams lie. And that's what we need to understand so that we can manage ourselves to greater amounts of wellness, to life satisfaction, to enduring satisfaction. So the real question is, what's the solution to that? And you might think, well, it's kind of the human condition, man. It's, this is the myth of Sisyphus. You're going to roll the rock up the hill. It's going to roll right back down. You're going to push that. You, you're never going to learn. But that's actually not true. A lot of people don't learn. The man on the plane evidently never learned, which is why he was so dissatisfied with his life when the glory years were gone, which is the striver's curse. But it, you don't have to be a victim of that. And there are a couple of things to think about and that I talk about in a real detail in my book. The first thing to keep in mind is that when it comes to satisfaction, we have a tendency to think that we'll be satisfied if we have what we want. And so we have a haves management strategy where the haves are experiences or relationships or rewards or things or status or prestige. That's a haves management strategy. You get, you put your sights on it. You get really good at getting it, get it, and then get more. And all, always getting, having your haves is what's your, is, is what you're trying to do to get satisfaction. But the truth is that the right model of satisfaction is not getting what you have. It's actually what you have divided by what you want. That's a better model. It's a more accurate model of true and lasting satisfaction. And so what you need is not a, a haves management strategy. You need a wants management strategy. When you think about it, if haves divided by wants equals satisfaction, then you can increase the numerator forever and fruitlessly. Or you can decrease the denominator of that fraction. And when a denominator of a fraction goes down, the number goes up. One of the greatest ways, one of the best proven ways by science and research on social psychology and even neuroscience is that by wanting less, we can become more satisfied. And so the solution is not to have more and to keep running, it's to want less. So I, I recommend to my students, for example, to stop doing bucket lists. Those are the stupidest things ever. They need a reverse bucket list. They need to learn to want less by throwing things out of their buckets, by taking away these cravings, these sticky desires. There's a word in Sanskrit, upadana, which means the sticky craving for inadequate things. You know, it's a whole paragraph of meaning in this one word in Sanskrit. And what it says is basically your satisfaction will never be met. And, and this is the words of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. He told me this when he was guest lecturing for me last year in my happiness class in Harvard. He said this, the, the secret to stable and lasting satisfaction is not to have what you want, but to want what you have. And so if we come back to success, I love that. Uh, who doesn't love the Dalai Lama? How do you define success? seems like we got, we have it all wrong. Yeah. So the way to define success is to, to begin with, to know ourselves. I mean, this is in the Oracle at Delphi, know thyself. Neuroscientists would call this metacognition, by the way. This is not just, just some philosophical or psychologized idea. When you're living from feeling to feeling in the limbic system of your brain, which is the ancient hardware processing emotions, you'll be very reactive. You'll be reactive to your urges, to your desires, to your appetites, to your feelings. Little kids are like this. I mean, you have two little kids and you know, you're always saying, use your words. And what you're asking them to do to be metacognitive, to not be so limbic. And that means you would, you move the feelings by thinking about them to the prefrontal cortex of the brain, the executive center of the brain, the human center of the brain. It's not the lizard brain at all. That's the big meaty lobes in the front of your head. Now, little kids don't have a very well-developed prefrontal cortex and they don't have a good connection between the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex, which is what we're trying to teach them. But a lot of adults don't do this very well either. So when we ask people to meditate on their feelings and urges, when we ask people to journal their feelings and urges, when we ask people to go to a psychoanalyst and talk about them, we're asking them simply the same thing, which is to make these urges, these feelings metacognitive so that they don't manage you, you can manage them. Once you've got them in the front of your head, literally in the front of your head, you can be the manager of these things. So this is the key thing to think about when we're talking about satisfaction. Make your urges known to you and don't just act on them automatically. And in so doing, you, you could just, you can perform miracles in your life. This is one of the big things I talk about that the consolations of age, older people get much better at metacognition, but they have to put in the work to get better at it. They're naturally good at it. If they actually do that. And, and all of us, one of the great secrets of older people who are happy. And again, this book is a 401k plan for happiness for all intents and purposes. It looks at the seven things that all happy old people do 
is that they chip away their desires, their earthly attachments, and they pay attention to the things that they really should be paying attention to. That is really the answer to your question. What is success? Our brain says it's money, power, pleasure, and fame. The truth is it's, it's the transcendental path. It's the love for your family. It's the real friendships that bring you satisfaction. And it's the work that you can do to earn your success and serve your sisters and brothers. That's it. Faith, family, friends, and work. That's true success that will bring lasting happiness. I love it. And you're also, you're touching on those seven big predictors, which you talk about in the book, the happy well study. Yeah. And we can control these pretty directly. Could, could you briefly, I love how straightforward and simple they were. Can you briefly touch on those seven big predictors? Yeah. So this is a study. This comes from a study called the Harvard study of adult development that I talk a lot about in this book that is an 84 year longitudinal study that started with Harvard graduates from the thirties. And this is like all, you know, upper class white men. So this is not very representative, but it was, a, it was very early on. It was matched up with something called the Gluck study from men of more or less the same generation who had not gone to college. And then it started to include their spouses and then their children. And it suddenly started to get very representative demographically across the population. And it followed this whole cohort for 84 years and their descendants. We, it's a wealth of data. It's a crystal ball. It looks at how did you live and what did you do in your twenties and thirties and forties? And then how happy and healthy were you in their seventies and eighties and nineties? So it's, you know, my students are super interested in this study, as you can imagine. And the guy who ran it for 30 years, a guy named George Valiant said, there's seven things that everybody does that were there if they're happy and well. And I look at the data, I find one extra thing. So I think there's, an, there's eight things actually, but his seven are. Some of them are really obvious. If you want to be happy and well, don't smoke, don't smoke cigarettes. And like these days, who in Gen Z, you know, or the millennials, you have a lot of millennial listeners and people who are younger than you, younger than me, of course, cause you're younger than me and, and they're way younger. And they're like, who smokes? I mean, everybody knows that smoking is really, really bad for you. But the interesting thing is it's not just bad for your health. It's bad for your happiness. And part of the reason is because you introduce avoidable problems. It's an unforced error is the bottom line. The second is drinking and drinking is a big deal in the Harvard study of adult development. A lot of people think that people drink in response to misfortunes in their life. It turns out that it's the opposite, that a lot of misfortunes come from alcohol use per se. And so the basic rule is if you want to be happy and well, when you're old, if you have a lot of alcoholism in your family, or you even suspect that you have a drinking problem, stop now. I mean, it may be that it's, some people think it's 60% genetic alcohol misuse disorder. It's a hundred percent environmental because I have this radical, incredible technology called not drinking and everybody can avail themselves of that technique. That's important. That number three and four are, are really simple. I mean, get your exercise and control your weight. And that doesn't mean radical stuff. It doesn't mean crazy things of ultra restrictive diets or yo-yo diets. Those are horrible for you. The things that you can't sustain, one of the reasons that diets have a 95% failure rate is because, you know, they're, we're really good at losing weight. We're really bad at keeping it off because it's, you know, if there's an old joke, uh, Jason, I love this joke. It's uh, it's what's first prize in a pie eating contest. And the answer is pie. So I hope you like pie. And that's basically dieting. First prize in a big old diet is never eating what you like for the rest of your life. You need to do sustainable things healthy things, the kind of stuff that you talk about on this show and making sure that you're getting your, that you're getting your exercise as well. I recommend an hour a day of people who don't exercise start by walking for an hour a day in a spiritual state without devices. And that's mind and body right there. So that's one, two, three, and four. The next one is continuous learning and continuous learning doesn't mean going to Harvard, the happiest people, they simply are curious about the world. So walk for an hour, read for an hour. If you can walk for an hour, read for an hour, it will change your life. The next one is actually not ruminating and having a, a good way to take care of life's travails, not learning how not to be a worrier, learning how to cope with problems in a healthy way. Some people need therapy for this. A lot of people like me have an active meditation practice that's very helpful or traditional religious faith. Excellent, but do something so that you can cope. Look, life's going to, suffering's going to find you. You have to find a way to actually not ruminate it and ruminate excessively on, on what life throws at you. And the last one is the moat for George Valiant and the study's most important. And I'm going to leave mine for the next one after this. He says that if he has to sum up all of happiness later in life in five words, it's that happiness is love full stop. 
This is about relationships. This is about if you have a, if you have a marriage to cultivate that marriage in companionate love for the number one ingredient in a happy marriage is friendship, not passion that you have to, you make sure with your true friendships, you have at least two super close friends and only one can be your spouse. And that it's a real friendship, not a deal friendship. This is a killer for strivers. And so happiness is love. Take care of these relationships and nurture them in an honest way. And my last one, which I believe does show up in the data, even though that George Valley didn't talk about it because he was a very secular person, is you need to walk a transcendental path. All the happy older people, they look for the transcendental. Now, whether they're completely secular, they're studying the lives of the Stoics, or whether they're pursuing a meditation or prayer practice or pursuing a, a traditional religion. I'm a practicing Catholic and I have a meditation practice. And, and this is just, there's just no substitute in this for this in my life. And I find that the happiest older people, they find a way to zoom out on life so they're not thinking about me, 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 any second that the transcendental path gives you peace and perspective. I love it. I love it. And a lot of the book, you talk about the, the decline that's inevitable as we age. It's something I think about. I'm a little younger. I'm 47. I got young kids, but I, I think about it. Everyone thinks about it. We've all seen the, the stereotypical headlines of the seasoned executive on wife number three or four or what have you, the buying the sports car. Like we, we've all, we, we've all seen this movie before. Yeah. With that said, what are the questions we should be asking ourselves as we hit middle age, when, when midlife comes, what should we be thinking about? There is inevitable change that comes to anybody, especially somebody who's had a lot of success or tried, who's worked to be excellent. And I'm not talking about rich and famous people. I'm not talking about people with a lot of money and who are well-known. I'm talking about excellent electricians and bus drivers and uh, teachers and people in all walks of life who tried to do a lot with their lives. And I'm really talking about the audience for the show because nobody's listening to this show who doesn't want to be better. Nobody's like, Hey, you know, I, I, I don't really care. So I'm going <laughs> to, so I'm going to listen to, you know, a wellness in progress and life podcast. This is the perfect audience to understand that, that for people who want to get better at things, that they need to understand that life is going to change and your strengths are going to change. Here's the, how the science works on that early on in life. You have what's called fluid intelligence. Fluid intelligence is your natural ability to focus, to concentrate, and to solve problems. That's what you're doing if you're doing a startup. That's what you're doing if you're getting better as a lawyer. That's what you're doing if you're in graduate school and killing it and studying late into the night. That's your fluid intelligence. It gets higher in your 20s, and it's getting higher in your 30s, and it peaks usually in your late 30s or early 40s and then starts to decline. Now, what happens for real strivers is that Nobody notices that they're having any decline at all because they're so good at what they do, but they notice a weird thing, which is they start to burn out. They start to feel bored with what they're doing and they don't like what they used to love very much. And it freaks them out because the worst thing is that I used to love my job as a lawyer and now I don't. And so they, they start looking for hobbies or they go into some sort of like midlife crisis and that it, it throws their relationships into crisis. I mean, a lot of people will have extramarital affairs. And it really comes from, they, they realize that they're not as good at what they, or they're not as interested because they're not as good at what they were doing. That's the bad news. The good news is there's a better strength curve that comes in behind the first one that most people, many people don't even know exists. That's called your crystallized intelligence curve. That increases through your 40s and your 50s and 60s and stays high in your 70s and 80s and even your 90s if, if you get your marbles that long. It is the best thing because it's your ultimate satisfaction that can come from success that actually lasts. And the best part of all is it's not your raw brains and hard work curve. It's your wisdom curve. It's like moving from Mark Zuckerberg to the Dalai Lama. It's your ability to teach, your ability to not answer any question, but to know which is the right question to ask. That's what you get good at. So people find like, I'm really good at explaining stuff. Why is that? It's because you have more crystallized intelligence than you used to have. Or lawyers who are really happy in their law firms, they were hot litigators early on. They become managing partners later where they're, they're it's like they, I used to be a ninja. Now I counsel a team of ninjas is kind of how they think about it. They will literally become teachers in any walk of life. They'll be counseling people. They'll be mentoring people. I know some people who literally go into teaching professions in the second part because they're naturally so good at it. And, and I'm telling you, it's a weird thing. I look back as a professor 
I look back at the papers I was writing, the academic papers I was writing in my early 30s, and I can't even read them. They're so technical. They're so like, I was doing genetic algorithms, which is an early form of artificial intelligence as a mathematical model to, to, to predict the behavior of governmental policy. I mean, it's just, it was so long here and I can't believe it. And, and now I can't read it, but what do I do? I, I actually harvest the interesting ideas of researchers all over the world. I combine them to write a column that has four or 500,000 readers a week. I become a teacher of ideas, a translator of ideas to a much, much bigger audience. I teach these ideas at the Harvard Business School to my students. They're not coming in as PhD students and as specialists in behavioral social science. They, they, they want the top line and how they can use it. And I can do that now because I have much higher crystallized intelligence. So the key is know that your skills are going to change, anticipate what kind of change and walk from one curve to another so that later you don't have to jump too far when you've gone down on the wrong curve and you're still struggling against your decline. Well, I think you've hit an important note with this idea of giving back, being a mentor. In the book, you cited this 2000 study, 2007 study I thought was fascinating by a team of researchers at UCLA and Princeton that analyzed data more than a thousand elderly people, which showed that senior citizens who never or rarely felt useful were nearly three times as likely as those who felt useful to develop a mild disability and more than three times as likely to have died during the study, just by yeah. feeling useful. Yeah, yeah. Relevance is everything. Usefulness is everything. The truth is every human being needs to be needed. And it's such a pity how we talk about so many different people. I mean, I've, I've worked a lot in public policy in my career, and I work a lot on government policy toward people who live in poverty, our brothers and sisters in the margins of society. And the, the greatest injustice is not the size of welfare checks or government programs. No, 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 no. I mean, those things are important. But what really matters is that we have a society that treats poor people as liabilities to manage. And we treat our own kids as assets to develop. And it's just such, it's so discriminatory. It's so morally wrongheaded because everybody needs to be needed. You want to give somebody hope. You want to give somebody happiness. You want to destroy the despair. Find a way that somebody can have the dignity of actually being needed. And it's, it's absolutely true for everybody. And we find that when old people, when they don't recognize their own usefulness because they're on the wrong curve and they were, when they're treated by other people to be useless because they, they don't know what gifts that they actually have, that they become disabled and they die earlier than they should. And it's a lot of it is preventable. Yeah. You know, I go back to the blue zones, multi-generational living. Yeah. 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 I mean, one of the ways to actually learn about happiness, you can take my class, you can read my book or you can talk to grandma. And the best way to do that is when grandma is living in a built in, a, in is living upstairs. And, you know, c coming back to, you know, the, the proverbial midlife crisis and just in general, I think also for people who strive to, to do good things, great things in life, whatever that may mean to them. You know, I, I go back to this idea of potential. So how do we identify and unlock our deepest potential in your words? Potential is interesting because it is the promise of being able to do something better. And I talk about it a lot with my business school students because they're very interested in finding their passion and doing what they're really great at. And one of the things that I tell them is to not be too stressed out about what their potential is with respect to, to, to one kind of skill. What they should be thinking about is their moral potential to lift people up and bring them together. So when I look at the happiest people at work, it doesn't have anything to do with a particular profession. You can be, you could be, you know, and almost you can be a waiter, you can be a professor, you can be a politician, you can be a podcaster. But the two things that actually brings joy and work are the sense that you are earning your success, that your skills meet your passions, that you're being rewarded for merit and accomplishment, and that you're serving people who need you. These are the two things. And so when I talk to people about their potential, I say, how do you understand those things? And how do you actually, how, how do you write your moral code? I make my students write their own personal mission statement about what earned success means to them or what service to other people means to them. And I say, okay, you can mold anything to which you have, you know, basic skills. And, and my students is the business world. And I teach policy students, it's public service. Mold it to those big goals and you will find your potential as life unfolds for you. And then, and then go from skill curve to skill curve and, and it's just 
so good. It's so joyful. And, and I'm living proof of this. You know, I did this research for me. I didn't do this. Re this is me search. You know, I, I did it because I wanted to understand what the future was going to look like for me so I could continue to create value and frankly, be happy. I left a pretty high powered executive job on the basis of this research. And I came back to the university to teach, write, and speak so I could use my crystallized intelligence so I could earn my success and I could serve as many people as I could. I'm going to lift people up and bring them together in bonds of happiness and love with writing, speaking, and teaching. I, I love that and it resonates with me. I think of Gen Z and there was, I, I don't recall who did the survey recently, but I think there was a survey where something like north of 50% of, of Gen Z, if given a choice to be a professional influencer on social media, that would be their dream career. So I'm somewhat concerned about the younger generation as you, as you're talking about happiness and success and being of service and all these things. And I think, okay. Yeah, I hear you. And actually there was, that was the, a lot of that, a lot of those findings are based on a big survey of British youth, uh, which might as well be American youth. We're all the same that the number one career for sixth graders at age 12, number one career choice in, in 1960 was doctor and the second was lawyer. Today it's YouTuber. Jason, that's a thing. Did you know that? That's a thing. YouTuber. 29% <laughs> said their first career choice would be a YouTuber. I mean, it's just, it's astonishing. I, I get it. And we, we sound like super old about that. You can create tons of value. I'm sure you can create tons of value, but obviously that's not the point. The point is not lifting people up. You know, like, I want to lift people up with my YouTube. It's, I want to get famous. I want to be admired. I want to be recognized. You know, I want to get these worldly rewards. And, and part of the problem is that we're not modeling the behavior that we want young people to have. If you want young people to have better values and we want them to learn the secrets to enduring satisfaction and enjoyment and purpose in life, we have to act that way ourselves. And I think that what's really made the whole thing misbegotten is the fact that people my age have modeled kind of bad behavior and young people coming in behind us are mimicking that behavior. Well, you know, not to go down the technology and social media or, or evil rabbit hole, but, you know, but I, I, I kind of will. You, you're having like old guys, you know, get the hell off my lawn. At this point. <laughs> but, but, you know, I think about the, the problems of social comparison, which you talk about in the book, keeping up with the Joneses, you know, Instagram is, is ripe for that. I, I also think about, yeah, I'll just stop right there. You know, as we talk about comparison and that's like, that's social media for you. Yeah, no, social media has made the natural tendency to social comparison, to engage in social comparison that much easier. Social comparison is an evolved, is an evolved trait. I mean, it makes perfect sense. It's not enough to have enough buffalo jerky and flints in your troglodyte cave. You need to have more than the next guy so that you can get mates. Because actually, social comparison is a way that we will assess fitness in, in ancient times. And the result is it's highly maladapted to circumstances of technology and abundance. And so what do we do? We don't know why, but we want to have more than the other guy. We want to have more admiration than the other guy. We want to have more book sales or podcast listeners than the other guy. And you have to moderate that because that's the road to perdition, you know, especially for people who have mood disturbances. We, it's very clear in, the, in all of the research that people who tend toward clinical depression and anxiety, social, social comparison is really deleterious to their mental health. I recommend to my students that if, if they are clinically depressed or have a diagnosis of anxiety, that they delete their apps because it's just too hard to use social media in a way where you're not going to fall prey to social comparison. Nobody puts on their Instagram, you know, uh, in their story with their pictures, you know, just my wife just yelled at me and my kid just flunked math. I mean, you don't do that. It's always beautiful things and a beautiful day and I'm eating a beautiful meal and all that. We post fake versions of ourselves. And we consume fake versions of other people while we live our humdrum lives. And that social comparison is incredibly hard on our mental health for the, under the best of circumstances, let alone if we're vulnerable to, to, to mood disorders. So it's really important that we keep, that we manage ourselves. And part of managing ourselves is making sure that we're not falling prey to that. And sometimes that means canceling ourselves from social media. <laughs> The only, the, the only type of canceling we allow is canceling yourself. The only cancel culture I love is when I cancel me. <laughs> so I, I'm curious that the book is filled with such great research. Was there any that stood out 
to you where, where your jaw just dropped and said, wow, I can't believe that. Yeah. There, there was a lot, it was moment after moment. It was a seven year project. And so it was just blowing my mind the whole, I didn't, I wasn't even going to publish it as a book, but it was, it was, you know, it was a life plan. And my wife's read it. She says, you know, you gotta share this thing, you know, my wife's always right. But there was one thing, I mean, I, one thing that really blew my mind. I mean, I tell this story about interviewing this woman on wall street for the book and, or for the research. And she's a Titan in the finance industry. She's started her own firm. She's very well rich, hundreds of millions of dollars, probably more, probably billions of dollars. And she's my age, you know, mid to late fifties. And she's kind of missing this step, but more importantly, she's not enjoying her life. You know, she drinks a little too much. She hasn't gone to the gym in a long time. She's starting, her wellness is falling off. But her relationships, I mean, she says that, you know, with her husband is like roommates. With her adult children, it's cordial. She doesn't have any real friends, only deal friends. And I, and she said, what should I do? And I said, what are you asking me for? You know, you don't need, you don't need a, a happiness professor for this. You know, <laughs> you know, exactly. You told me what you need to do. You need to stop drinking. You need to get into AA probably. You need to get into the gym. You need to go away with your husband. You need a daily conversation with your children and you need to take a souvenir in your firm and back off the work. Come on. Why don't you do that? She thought about it. She goes silent. This is what blew my mind. She said. I think I'd prefer to be special than happy. And I'm like, whoa, because, you know, I've done a lot of work, a lot of research on addiction. And you and I both have known a lot of addicts, a lot of people addicted to drugs and alcohol. And they all know that it's their impediment to happiness. There's not one alcoholic who thinks, you know, the source of my happiness is drinking too much and blacking out. Nobody. They all know that. But the truth is, if you ask them for an honest, reason why they continue this behavior, they'll say that they prefer to be high than happy. That's why they keep doing it. And that's what she was telling me. I would prefer to be special than happy. She is a self-objectifier. She's a success addict. And here's why it blew my mind. I was too. I was too. And so were a lot of people who were listening to us. They prefer to be special than happy. They're making specialness decisions, not happiness decisions. Look, anybody can do that boring happiness stuff. Anybody can hang out with their kids. Anybody can have a, enough time with a spouse to have an ongoing, healthy marriage. Anybody can do that stuff, but not everybody can start a company. Not everybody can have a successful podcast. Not everybody can have a best-selling book. No, that's special, man. That's special. And people choose that all day long to their peril. Because look, happiness, it's not all up to you, but a lot of it is up to you. And if you don't make the right decisions, you won't find it. If you don't manage yourself, if you don't sacrifice the homo economicus of you inside you hitting the lever, getting the cookie, getting the dopamine, you're just not going to find it. That blew my mind. That, that set me on my heels, quite frankly. It made me ask a lot of very hard questions about the decisions that I had made. I quit my job on the basis of that. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what was the big, what change did you make? I quit my job. I was a CEO. I was the, I was the president of a think tank in Washington, DC, which was you know, it wasn't, I was ready GM, but I was at this thing, the, one of the oldest think tanks in the world. Sure. That was at the vortex of these policy wars, very famous think tank called the American Enterprise Institute, which I had been doing for a long time and it was going really well. And I, it's all I did, man, 80 hours a week. I was addicted to it. I was addicted to the rewards of it. I didn't even like it all the time. I wasn't even happy. I was lonely. My wife was lonely. You know, it's funny. You know, so I'll tell you the greatest regret of my life is that I never got to know my parents very well. I mean, we, they were really good parents. My father was a brilliant biostatistician. My mother was a well-known artist. They were interesting people, but I bailed when I was 19. I moved to the East Coast and then on to Europe. And, and like, I saw them every couple of years. And I always thought, golly, I gotta get to know them because they're such interesting cultured people. And they were so good to me. They were such good parents. And then they died. They, they died young. You don't have the time you think you've got is the bottom line. And I've regretted that for years. And it came back to me when that lady told me that. And I thought, no, 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 I do get a do-over. It's called my adult children. And now we talk every day, every day. No, I mean, they don't maybe like it, but I do, you know, <laughs> on FaceTime with my child. I have one child studying in Spain. I have one who's a four deployed combat Marine. And I have one who's a school teacher. And Every day we have a close relationship. We have a loving relationship that I didn't have with my parents. And I have that lady in, in, in New York city to thank for that. And so I'm going to come back to goals 
you know, and, and you talk about the book because you don't want to you know, be climbing a ladder your entire life and then get to the top and realize it's the wrong ladder. How do you, it, it goes back to, I think, a concept, a cousin of that is this concept in the book you go into intrinsic versus extrinsic goals. So can you right. spend a little time on that? This gets back to the idols versus the habits of the happiest people. The idols, once again, from St. Thomas Aquinas, he talks about them as substitutes for God. That's how he thinks about them. And they have divine characteristics because they satisfy this urging of the heart a little bit, but they take you 180 degrees off the transcendental truths of a satisfying life. Money, power, pleasure, and fame. Money, power, pleasure. He calls it honor, but that has kind of a different sense today. It, he really means prestige. Those are extrinsic goals. Those are goals of the world. Extrinsic means they come from the outside. The, the rewards come from the outside. And there's a lot of research that shows that when people have extrinsic goals, they tend to hit them, but they don't tend to be happy or healthy as a result of that. They enjoy their lives less. They, it, they, extrinsic goals overpromise and underdeliver. And furthermore, they, even the joy that they do give doesn't last because of the hedonic treadmill, because of the homeostasis we talked about a minute ago. The intrinsic goals are things that are intrinsically rewarding. They're the rewards that come from within. And that's faith, family, friendship, and work that serves other people. And by the way, what is faith? What is the, the transcendental path? The family relationships, the real friendships and work that serves others have in common. It's love and more love. Love is the ultimate intrinsic reward. And that actually has to be your own measure of success. And, like, and, and again, there's nothing wrong with the extrinsic stuff, but it has to be intermediate. It has to be instrumental. It can't be intrinsic. And so you say, you know, why do I want to make money? Because I want to have enough to support my family, but not more than I need for that, because then it will be a substitute for my family. Why do I want power? Because I can do good things with power. If I'm a, if I'm a benevolent person, I can actually run a company that's helpful for humanity. What, what do I want? admiration because I want people to admire something that's really meritorious and help them live up to their own particular goals. But if what I'm starting and pleasure is a key element of enjoyment, which is part of happiness. And so the key thing is not letting those things become our intrinsic goals, make them instrumental goals toward the intrinsically rewarding things, which I talk about in the book is the only things that will ultimately satisfy the habits of the happiest people at every age is faith, family, friends, and work that serves. I think so important. That's why I wanted to come back to that one. And yeah, you know, I'm curious, there's so much going on in the world. I'll, I'll timestamp this because the world is changing rapidly. We're talking at March 15th, around 5, 520 Eastern time, because this will air a little bit later. So I'm curious on, on March 15th, what concerns Arthur Brooks, what excites Arthur Brooks? I have the same concerns as everybody else. I have the same concerns for the future of the United States, the most prosperous, generous, upwardly mobile country in the history of the world. And yet one in which it appears that people on both sides of the political spectrum, the one thing they can agree on is that we're a crummy country in decline. That concerns me a lot, just as a political, geopolitical matter, but also as a matter of what we can do in the world as a gift to the world to lift people up now and going forward. I'm concerned about a lot of the other things that we see about the war and, and quite frankly, the pestilence that we just went through. But here's what I'm most excited about, that those things are opportunities for an entrepreneurial person, for an entrepreneurial society and culture. The United States is very good at seeing trouble and turning it into progress. And then that's in point of fact, the essence of what a, a population based on immigration is all about, you know, the, you know, your ancestors, I'm going to say, were not landed gentry in this country. They were probably, you know, running away from some godforsaken shtetl or some potato farm that they didn't like on the, where they might starve or get killed. And they turned it into an opportunity for true life startup entrepreneurship. And that's what has always happened. That's what I'm dedicating myself to in this particular case. And I'm already seeing green shoots coming from this. We're coming out of this coronavirus epidemic, which is nothing, I mean, it, it's amazing, I guess, but it's nothing extraordinary. Every 10 years, there's something like this in American life. The coronavirus epidemic, a decade ago, it was the financial crisis, which was equally disequilibrating. A decade before that, it was 9-11. A decade before that, it was, it was the Cold War and the end of the Cold War. I mean, all these geopolitical events that, that disequilibrate our lives massively, and every time we're surprised. And 
And then we get ready to, to fight the next version of the old battle. So, you know, 10 years from now, when something huge happens, we'll be talking about viruses and financial crises and we'll get caught out again for sure. So I'm not worried about the fact that these kinds of things happen. What I'm encouraged about is that we're coming out of the coronavirus epidemic and there's a massive upsurge in appetite for information about wellness, love, and happiness. Look, there's a reason that you have this massively popular show. People want the information. 10 years ago, it wouldn't have been the same thing. I mean, maybe, but I actually see this. I see more demand for the kind of stuff that I'm doing, which I'm dedicating to love and happiness for all people. And when there's more interest because there has been suffering, it, it proves a principle, a, a basic happiness principle, which is that if you try to just get rid of all unhappiness in your life, you'll inadvertently get rid of a good part of your happiness because suffering leads to purpose. Suffering leads to meaning. Suffering is an incredibly sacred thing. And when we do put all of our energy into not suffering, we won't find purpose and meaning, which is one of the macronutrients of happiness. So if we can put what we just, the trauma that we've just all gone through, some more than others, of course, if we can put that as a society toward a better opportunities to love each other, to give each other dignity, to lead, to, li to, to lift each other up and, and to find the secrets to happiness in our own lives. This could be the greatest decade in many decades in American life. Amen. We'll close there. Arthur Brooks, a pleasure from strength to strength. Go pick it up. Thanks so much.